if you're just joining us either here or on live streaming, we welcome you into the conversation. This is actually a conversation that started Easter morning. Uh, Easter morning, we celebrated the death, burial, but resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so many times what ends up happening is, you know, that is a good spot for an amen. I'll, let's give that another run. I'm sorry that I just skirted over that too fast. Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And it is. So uh, we call that a cheap pop. That's what that's called. So uh, all of a sudden, um, we have the belief system that Jesus died so that we could only go to heaven. That is true. Because of our eternal salvation, we get to spend eternity with Christ. But Jesus did so much more than that for us. We have life to live now, and life now isn't about holding on till we die. Life's about living life to the fullest, but what does that look like? What does that mean? What's the purpose to life? Well, last week we discussed what is the purpose of life, and we actually quoted a good old-fashioned statement that says this, we are here to give God glory and to forever enjoy Him. That's a purpose, but what's the meaning behind life? I have a question right now. If I ask you to close your eyes, if I ask you, if a stranger walked up to you and said this, what is the meaning of life? Let's be real honest. Did anything come to your mind at all? Or did, did you kind of drop that, that bucket down that well, bring it up completely empty? Like that's one of those heavy questions. Did I have my go-to phrase when someone said, what's the meaning of life? But yet if you think about it from the youngest of age, we are searching for the meaning of life. What does this look like? Your, your child comes up to you and you tell them something, something occurs in their life and they ask this one profound question, why? And then you give them an equally profound answer and they follow it up with, why? And then you actually come up with a second, third, fourth answer till you finally get to the universal answer that stops them because, <laughs> right? Isn't that the one, somehow you lay that out and the why question ends, but it's because deep down inside of us from the youngest of age, we are trying to discover the meaning behind why. And so today we're going to do this, but I want to look at what some other people, some, actually the first one I want to look at is the Dalai Lama. When he was asked, what is the meaning to life? He said, the meaning of life is happiness. Hard question is not, what is the meaning of life? No, hard question is, what makes happiness? This is the question all human beings must try to answer. What makes true happiness? And I, I got to be honest, when I first read it, the initial thought I had was, happiness happens because of our happenings around us. So if something around us isn't happening the way we want it, does that mean we lose our happiness? And if it's all about finding just happiness in the environment that we're in, isn't that kind of self-centered, maybe even humanistic? Like I kind of went, I, here's, here's the way that I would say this. When I read that, that didn't satisfy my craving for the answer of meaning. Okay, so then here's an, Joseph Campbell. Life has no meaning. <laughs> Wouldn't you want to have dinner with this guy, right? <laughs> if I'm going to have a family party, bring this guy in. Life has no meaning. Each of us has meaning. And so now all of a sudden you got my attention. You turn this around. And we bring it to life. It's a waste of time. It is a, a waste to be asking the question, when you are the answer. So when I first read that, I went, that sounds really profound, right? Life has no meaning, but we're meaning, so we bring meaning to life. Now life has meaning because we showed up. But the problem is, I'm the one searching for meaning. So how can I bring that which I haven't discovered or don't know about? Does that make sense? And so now also I'm, I'm reading that, I'm going, well, that doesn't really satisfy me either. So Mumford says this, man's chief purpose is the creation and preservation of values. That is what gives the meaning to our civilization, and to participate in this is what gives significance ultimately the, uh, to the individual human life. We're supposed to create values. Create values based on what? creates values based on the life that I live and the experience that I've had because I'll tell you someone who's grown up in an affluent house with food on the table and cars in the garage is going to bring a whole different set of values from someone maybe from an inner city depending on what generation you were part of civil rights on you're going to bring a different set of values so I'm supposed to create values based on what it seems like it should be based on something external from me that or what happens if two people come to the same place with this different set of values do we punch it out actually yes that's how wars are created 
or you play hockey. I'll give you that one. Go Blues. I, I, I owe you that one. I got to admit, if you don't follow me on Facebook, I owe you that one. I'm sorry for all of you that they're liking you right now. Don't say it. Don't say it. I love this quote from the philosopher Jim Carrey. Didn't see that one coming, did you? So I love it. I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they've ever dreamed of so they can see that it isn't the answer. And, and by the way, I, I think he's qualified to say that. We, when I said Jim Carrey and his picture popped up, was there anyone who had never heard of him before? You, you probably have. Because he's had influence. He's had success. He's made money. He's lived a life. And what he's saying is now that he got all that, he's looking backwards and saying that isn't it. Isn't it amazing sometimes when we want to know what something is, you kind of have to explore what it isn't? And through exploring what it isn't, we decide and we discover what it is. And so that's actually what we're going to do today. We're going to look at what meaning isn't. And there's only one person in the Bible overly qualified to do this, and it's a guy named Solomon wisest man who's ever lived and if you don't know the story of who this guy is there was a time when God wanted a group of people that he could really work with that he could give them laws and he could be their king and they start implementing on, on the world around them and so he got a group called the Israelites Has anyone ever heard of the Israelites before so they got the Israelites and the Israelites at one point did a really real honestly a boneheaded thing they said we need a king just like everybody else and God goes, you have a king, it's me. They go, no, we need a man. Because if you're going to trust anybody, trust man over God. This is a life lesson we all need to learn right here. Bad decision. So they hired a king, Saul. He was really bad. Got fired in like 48 hours. It was amazing how bad, how quick he was. And then David became king. King David, anyone? David and Goliath, you've probably heard that story before. Well, David had a son named Solomon. Solomon ended up taking over the kingdom. This is about 3,000 years ago. And Solomon was considered the wisest man who's ever lived. He's actually journaled that and written for us in different parts of the Bible, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Song of Solomon. So we're going to look at Ecclesiastes, where the word meaningless is used 38 times in the Bible. 35 of the times are right here in this one book. So if we want to know what the meaning of meaningless is, how about we go to the, the guy who kind of has the market cornered. So if you open up to Ecclesiastes 1, I have provided the scriptures on the board for you, which, by the way, we're going to be covering a lot of scriptures with me. So stay focused. This is, this is beautiful stuff if you really start unpacking it. And it says the words of the teacher, this is the son of David, king of Jerusalem. So what it did, it just identified Solomon in verse number 1. Meaningless, meaningless, he says. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. One, two, three, four times in one verse. Like he's going to drill this point home. Is what do people gain from all their labors in which they toil under the sun? All the work that you do, what, what do you gain? Generations, they're going to come. And just so you know, generations, they're going to go. But the earth will remain forever. And by the way, the sun is going to rise and the sun's going to set. And it hurries back from where it was risen or where it rises from. And then by the way, the wind, it's going to blow to the south and it turns to the north. And round and round it goes, returning on its own course. Verse 7 says, all streams flow into the sea, but yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come, they're going to return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. Eyes are never, have had, uh, the eyes never has enough to see, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. Ready for this? There's nothing new under the sun. Well, he didn't have computers. No, I, I, he had forms of entertainment. He had the ability to do work. They had a network where they communicated. Now, granted, it was probably someone on the back of a camel going for a ride. So computers just made life faster. didn't make life necessarily different. There were still human struggles. There were still inventions being done. He's saying there's nothing new under the sun. Actually, what he's saying is everything in life is just reciprocal. You, it, it just goes round and round. The sun comes up, and guess what? Tonight it's going to do. Go, go down and this wind actually can we pray for the wind to keep blowing and get these storms just right past us and just just keep on blowing but but tomorrow the winds are just going to blow again from the north to the south and they're just going to continue their cycle think about this all the streams they pour into the ocean and that ocean should have been full by now but it's not because then it evaporates and it goes in the clouds and the clouds redistribute it to the top of the streams and the streams now flow again and guess what life is just reciprocal and if you think about it so is yours 
Think about life. Can I ask you a question? How really different is your life five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? Did you get up, get ready for work, go to work? Go to work for what? A paycheck? To then come home, maybe spend time with family? Maybe, maybe do more work at your house? Maybe pay the bills for the car that you shouldn't have bought two, uh, a while ago that you're going to work for to pay off? And so now you go to bed and guess what? The next morning you do what? And get up and do the same thing. This is so depressing right now, right? This is like, for those of you online, if you're still watching, like, <laughs> this is just a downer. But, okay, maybe you have a different job. Uh, th- let me ask you this. Maybe, maybe you were working 15 years ago and you're retired now. I have a question. In your retired life, does life look the same? You get up. And, and my guess is, and I love asking this question to retired people, are you busier now or when you worked? And they all answer and say, busier now. I think it's because grandchildren take advantage of them. I got to be honest. Oh, you're free to babysit. Can I get an amen from a grandma and grandpa somewhere? So at some point, it, it is, it is you start living your life, and it just kind of seems mundane, and it's monotonous. And if you think about it, you, one day, you're just going to die, and five generations from now, no one's going to remember you. I mean, that's it. Solomon, he, he's writing this. We're still talking about him 3,000 years later, but he goes on to say, listen, a generation's going to come and a generation's going to go. It's all meaningless because once we're gone, it's gone. I'm actually going to leave all my stuff to someone else, and I don't really know who they are. So running around toiling after these things, it is all meaningless. And so we, we look at our lives and you think, why do I keep getting into this bad relationship? Because you're just in a revolving cycle and you are the problem. Why do I keep going to a job that I don't like? Well, I'll get a new job and get a new job and I don't like it. You're the problem. You, you are just continuing to recycle that. And with our journey with God, I'd even say even in our religion, there's times where we want more of God, but we want to give him enough that we don't get in trouble, but we won't, don't want to give him so much that he has control of our life. And we wonder why we keep coming back to these pain points. And I wrote this, you'll always return to the, the point of pain if you continue to make the same choices. And all these choices that we make, they're just meaningless, meaningless. But the problem is, we are a society, we are a person, we are individuals that we crave meaning because we were created for meaning. So we start looking for meaning everywhere we can. Solomon then, he goes into a discussion in the beginning of chapter 2 where he goes, I'm going to go ahead and explore some places that humanity will want to explore for meaning, and I'm going to tell you these aren't the right places to go to. So here's what Solomon does in Ecclesiastes 2. He goes, let's look at this thing. He said, I said to myself, come now, I'll test you with pleasures to find out what is good. But what also prove, by the way, these pleasures that we're going to be seeking, they're also going to prove to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, it's madness. And what does the pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, but my mind still guided me with, um, with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under heaven during the few days of their life. Because in life, this meaningless life that we're living, we actually want to find pleasure in it. But in trying to find pleasure into it, we're going to chase something that, as, when it all gets said and done, will not bring us the pleasure that we're looking for. But the crazy, crazy thing is we are pleasure-seeking beings. God created our flesh to feel So we want to seek those things. Our tongue, right now, if I start describing my go-to meal this past week, and by the way, it involves a lot of grease all over the stove, and I'm fine walking out of the kitchen because it's, it's magic. I leave, and I come back the next day, and it's clean. It's the greatest kitchen in the world. I haven't figured out who or what does it, but it, so, so I take a cast iron pan, and I throw two pieces of bacon. And after that bacon cooks off, I pull that out of a cast iron pan and immediately, not draining it, drop the hamburger in. Because you can only cook a burger in bacon grease. That's right. But at the same time, you drop a jalapeno in there. I have a question. Is anyone's pleasure sensors in your mouth going, I like where you're going with this. Tell me about the toasted bun. All right? Like, you want to, because we're seeing... Everything has a meaning. You know, when we decorated the church, they looked at colors and tried to figure out what is a warm color. Because some colors are just loud, not welcoming, because everything seems to have meaning. So we're going to chase the things that we think will bring us meaning. But Solomon's saying, be careful what you chase, because there's a good chance it'll end up leading you down a dead road. For instance, drinking wine. Got to let you in on a little bit of secret. I 
I remember growing up, my parents going, you know, you really don't want to drink, it'll hurt you. And, and I remember the first time I had a drink, and I went, they did that wrong, because that didn't hurt me at all. Actually, I'll be honest with you, I had a lot of fun with it. And, and I, this is horrible to tell you, but by the way, my first drink was Purple Passion. And if you're buying your alcohol in a two-liter bottle, it's not good alcohol. But I didn't matter. I had this drink, and all of a sudden, I started feeling good. Not only did I start feeling good, I looked better. It was amazing. I'm sorry, I took this drink, and I started looking better. And I know that I looked better because when I went up and talked to that girl, she told me I looked better, and I was smooth. I have never talked smoother to a female in my life. And I started laying down my, my uh, well, I don't even know the phrase, uh, Laying down my inhibitions, yes, but actually this was my line is what I was laying down to her. And then she's like, hey, do you want to dance? And I'm like, I'm the greatest dancer in the history of dancing. And I remember dancing and cutting up the rug and looking fantastic, and I didn't die. Actually, I didn't. not only did I not die, I was profound that night. We had conversations. I solved world hunger. Didn't take notes, should have. But I was so profound in everything that I said. I remember looking back going, this wine didn't kill me. This wine made me better and it was fantastic. And so I thought, what other pleasures should I explore? Because I remember when it said, when it comes to your entertainment, don't watch R-rated movies. Well, I watched a few R-rated movies, and I'll be honest with you, they were kind of funny. They were kind of enjoyable. There were some pictures that popped up that I'd never seen before. And Oh, wow. What's that? And so I started exploring all these different things. And then I remember growing up in a church, and I would even say it today, don't have sex before you're married. It's going to hurt you. And then I kissed somebody. Well, that didn't hurt me. I think my parents are doing this wrong. Like, and, and then it went a little bit farther down the road, and I started finding a whole lot of pleasure doing things that I was told it was going to hurt me. And, and, and I tried it through entertainment. I tried it through drugs and alcohol. I tried it through sexual relationships. And all of a sudden, I'm finding a whole lot of joy in this. And then I look back on it and I go, everything that, uh, do, and everything that eventually destroys us gives us pleasure on the front side. Because it, it's interesting. Solomon's trying to tell me something that I actually think my parents were trying to tell me. It's not that you're going to take a drink of beer and immediately die, but if beer becomes the thing that pleases you, if pleasure becomes the meaning that you're seeking, eventually you will find no meaning in that pleasure at all. And the thing that's supposed to be bringing us happiness will actually only end up bringing us remorse because it isn't that you had a drink. Can I just say, it isn't that you had a beer. It isn't that you had a drink. It's when you start only being able to function in life because you have a drink. It's now all of a sudden, man, I used to be healthy, I used to be strong, but now I've gained 50 pounds because I can't put this thing down, and I don't know how to relate to the world around me. This thing that once brought me pleasure, and I thought I could find meaning and pleasure, is now the only thing I run to, run to, and in running to this, I seem to disfranchise everybody that used to uh, love me. And then my forms of entertainment, guess what? I, I started watching that entertainment, and those jokes are funny, so next thing I know, I'm saying those jokes because what I put inside of me eventually becomes the identity that I start, my persona that I put outside of me. And so now I'm saying the entertainment that I'm watching, but that entertainment wasn't quite good enough. So I go from a shoot 'em up bang em up movie to an all-out horror film, and next thing I know, I'm watching highly inappropriate stuff that if anybody would know that I'm watching, I feel bad about, including pornography. Because when I had sex the one time, when I kissed the one girl, that was no big deal. But what was happening was it wasn't that I brought death to my life, but I started uh, uh, corroding my soul. So now I'm with my wife after 12 years, I'm kissing her. And while we're kissing, an ex-girlfriend decides to do a pop-in. What are you doing here? Well, it's because you gave yourself to me. Part of your soul was connected to my soul. And then the, the, the sex with one person, relationship with one person was enough, so I start watching stuff online, and that becomes ever increasingly shameful porn that you have to watch, and eventually what you're seeing on screen is better than what you have in person, and when you have that thing in person, things aren't working like they're supposed to because you're used to a Photoshopped, airbrushed person online. And Solomon goes, if you think the meaning to life is pleasure, what I'm trying to tell you is you'll lose all pleasures in life. Because the thing we ran to to enjoy will eventually be the thing that can control, corrodes us. And Solomon goes, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. And he goes, well, let's look at success, though. Ecclesiastes 2, 4 says, 
I undertook, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself, and I planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs of water, groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female sle slaves and other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds of flocks than anyone else in Jerusalem. Look at me. I'm successful. Because after all, the American dream is you have to be successful. The problem is most Americans' dream are nightmares. Because we're living this revolving life, this rotating life, this never-ending life, and we're chasing after this success dream that never seems to have an ending point. So the best example that I can come up with is a political example. But I need you to know I'm not making a political statement. But as I'm studying what is success, I started thinking about this. Why would Donald Trump run to be President Donald Trump? Because if you think the business lane, he was successful there. He proved himself to be successful there. And again, if you're sitting there now going, well, Donald Trump wasn't successful. He had bankrupts. You got to hear the point. We all know who Donald Trump is because he made a success of himself. Now he decides to get out of that lane altogether and jump over to the political lane only to find success there. If success, if meaning of life is in success, at some point you ring the bell of success and the craving for meaning inside of you should be sustained. Problem was you have this man who craved success. He got it. Now he craves something else. Why can't you be satisfied? Because the definition the elusive nature of meaning isn't found in the success that you have. And if you're sitting there going, well, sure, he made a political statement. Okay, let's go to Michael Jordan playing basketball, decides to play baseball. Let's go to Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook. At some point, you've made enough money and we're all on Facebook. Why don't you just retire, right? You have everything you need, hit the bell of success and walk out the door because you have meaning in your life. But the problem is there will always be someone more successful. There will always be one more thing you want to have. And you end up living your life chasing after the dream that success will give you meaning. And if you do that, it'll be like you're chasing the wind. And you'll just need more success after more success and more significance after more significance. And eventually your identity will be found in what you've done versus who you are. And the moment what you've done collapses, falls, change, alters, you lose your identity. And Solomon one of the most, maybe the most successful king of all time in all of Israel is going, I just need to tell you this. If success is your pursuit of meaning, it's meaningless. So if we're chasing pleasures, if we're chasing success, if we're chasing wealth, I amass silver and gold for myself and the treasures of a king in all the providences. I acquired male and female singers in a Harlem as well. By the way, uh, he had like 900 wives in Harlem and, and concubines. Harem. I thought that was a basketball group. Harlem Girl Tribe, a bad joke. Move on. So if you look at how long he lived, he roughly got married every two weeks. Good for that guy. But I'll be honest with you. First of all, non-biblical. Second of all, if there's someone who is pursuing meaning, this is the classic definition. He said, I became greater by far than anyone else in Jerusalem before me, and all this wisdom stayed with me. I, I, how many have ever heard the phrase, money doesn't buy happiness? Yeah, I disagree. I, I do. My wife and I, we've not had money, and we have had money. Just to go on record. I like having money more than not having money. And if I'm a bad person for saying that, I apologize. But here's the other fact behind it. Our money doesn't define us. Our wealth doesn't define us. So we had to drop the minivan off. That's right. We rock a minivan with four kids. You kind of have to. I wanted to go conversion van, but we stopped at four kids. So hey, I, we had to drop the car off to get some work, and we got a loaner van. And we brought it home 20,000 miles, smelled brand new, looked great. We pulled it into the garage. W my wife walked out. My boys walked out, and they saw a new van. And, Daddy, you got us a new van. Well, borrowed. Cammie started looking all around it, and she all of a sudden said, why don't you call them, find out what they'll do to keep ours, and we'll just keep this. <laughs> and it was interesting because we were very content with our minivan before we started comparing. If you want to stay content in life, stop comparing. Because every time you compare, you'll no longer be content. But here's where our conversation with what's better, 
taking money out of savings, making a car payment, wherever you're at in life, decreasing your net worth, that's the way I would say it, to buy something that you already have completely paid for. And we went, no, we're good. We'll keep rocking this minivan with the beat up bumper. We're good with it. And so all of a sudden, it's fine to have money, but if your whole life, if your meaning comes from having wealth in your life, then you will never have enough because here's what happens. You set new normals in your life. If you haven't heard anything today and you're struggling with finances, you have to hear this. You can get as much of a raise next week and you will still have as much debt as you do now because your new normal will just go up. So reset your new normal, which by the way, this is one of the hardest things to do is choosing to reset your normal because when you start looking at wealth if this is your identity in christ your answer will be what most most americans say how much would be enough and most americans answer this a little bit more can't even put a dollar amount on it just a little bit more than i have now and solomon's saying this you can have more you can have everything i had all the money that money could buy and guess what meaningless meaningless so then he goes on to say this in verse 10. He goes, I denied myself nothing. He no pleasure did he deny himself. Every success that he wanted to see, everything he wanted to have built, every lake that he wanted to have dug, he made. He denied himself everything. Everything that my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labors. This was the reward for all my toil. Now before I read verse 11, you have to hear this. You need to know this. We learn in our life either by our own failures or by someone else's. So in your life, you can go down the road of pleasure for meaning. You can go down the road of success for meaning. You can go down the road of wealth for meaning. Or you can let this guy who already walked those roads turn back and go, you need to learn something. So Solomon just walked down all these roads, turning back 3,000 years later to you to say this. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I have toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. As chasing after the wind, nothing was gained. Nothing was gained under the sun that's just going to continue to revolve. The wind is going to continue to blow the money that I made, the impact that I thought I had, the pleasures that I was seeking after, all of it was meaningless. Okay. What else, Solomon? Like, don't get me wrong, bud, but you kind of have to go somewhere from here. But the problem is he doesn't. He just keeps being very negative. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Until the very end. So can we do this? Can we kind of jump to the end of the book to read this amazing Ecclesiastes 12, 13? He says this. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Summarizing the sentence. Here we go. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Fear God and keep all of his commandments. All of his commandments. Only a couple hundred of them. Keep every one of them and you'll have meaning in your life. And I, I got to be honest, Solomon is a little too broad of a stroke for me. But here's the benefit of being a Christian in the year 2017. We get to look at what Jesus said about what Solomon was saying. So if you don't know how the Bible works, it, it works like this. We've been reading out of the Old Testament. And it's looking forward to someone still to come. So some of the things they were saying didn't quite make sense yet. But it wasn't until that someone came and looked back on everything they said that we started getting clarity on what was trying to be communicated. So Jesus now comes, and he's in the middle of a conversation of these Pharisees, always trying to trip him up, always trying to stop him, always trying to confuse the matter at hand. And someone said to Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And oddly enough, it was answered correctly. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 38, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So today, at my maybe feeble attempt to answer the eternal question is what is the meaning to life? I'm going to say this to you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Because here's the thing. When we put God first, he will give us wealth. 
when we give, put God first, he will give us pleasures. When we put God first, he will give us success. But it's in the proper order that it should be. Because when you choose wealth, success, and pleasures, you're seeking the creation, not the creator. But when we make it our chief duty, when we say our meaning in life is to seek the creator of these things, the creator of these things say, now you're going to handle them properly. And you won't let your soul get corroded away because you don't know how to handle the wine, the wealth, and the success, the pleasures, the impact, and the influence. And all of a sudden, now we look at this, but here's the second thing it says. And the second, though, he doesn't leave it there. He goes, the second thing is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so we're going to make fortune cookies, and we're going to put the meaning to life in there. And when you open up this fortune cookie, it's called a Christian cookie, by the way, because I'm just religious enough not to keep saying fortune cookies. So we're going to make Christian cookies, and they're going to they're look like little fish. That's what they'll look like. They'll look like little fish. <laughs> And they, they taste like manna. And if you don't know what manna tastes like, it's chocolate. So chocolate or cake or something like donut. But deep fried donut, deep fried donut from Snooks this morning. Why? Because we had to get communion bread and donuts were nearby. And so you open up this little, this little Christian cookie fish thing. And you'll see one piece of paper says the meaning to life. Love God and love people. And, and we can never mix those up. And we can never put our priorities in the wrong position so in a moment we're going to love God through the celebration of the communion meal but before we do that I want to love people and here's why I love you enough to boldly stand up here and tell you about a man named Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago Jesus Christ not only came to give us purpose but to give life meaning and if you're here today, and somehow as I've been talking, and I'll tell you, it, I'll even say this, it, it may be physically happening to you, something inside of your heart, something inside of your soul, something inside of your mind's going, this actually, he hasn't answered everything, but he's giving answers to something. It's because I believe you're searching for meaning, and you're searching for purpose, and Jesus didn't come here just so you can spend eternity on earth or, or in heaven. He came so that while you're on earth, you don't bankrupt your life pursuing passions that will end up destroying you. Pursuing success that will never build you. Pursuing wealth that will only end up bankrupting you. So I love you enough to want to ask this question. Are you here today and you would like to know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? The man who inspired these words by Solomon to give to us died on a cross for you because there was a debt that you couldn't pay, but he was willing to do for you. So I'm going to actually ask you to respond, but I love you enough to not make it awkward for you. Could I ask everyone to bow your heads, close your eyes, and do this? Just kind of become to yourself for a moment. Don't look around. Don't see if someone's raising their hand. Don't see if someone's responding. But as I've been saying this, there's something inside of you going, yes, I want to respond. I want to be that follower of Jesus Christ. I want to live a life that I'm no longer living meaningless, meaningless, fatalistic, failing philosophies that rotate through. If you're here today and you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm just going to ask you to simply raise your hand in the air. No one else is watching. No one is paying attention to you. But there's a God in heaven looking at you today. I see that hand over there. I see that hand right there. I see that hand back there in the back. Two hands back there. All the way in the rear of the church, I see you. God, we thank you that you love people. thank you that you loved us enough to send your one and only son, your one and only son. For all of us that believe in him, we will have eternal life. So can we all say this prayer together? There's so many hands that went up. I want to all say this prayer together. God, today, I accept your definition of meaning in my life. I do not want to seek pleasures wealth, 
and success. But I want to seek you, the giver of wealth, success, and pleasures. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And with my mouth, I confess, you are Lord. God, I just thank you today that you loved us enough to send your one and only son. And God, we celebrate today with all those who said yes to you. We celebrate today, God. Lord, you are doing amazing things here at Navigation Church. And we would not want to go one Sunday without recognizing the grace that is here for people to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So today, God, we proclaim that good news. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, can you put your hands together and just welcome those that made that decision in your life?